All right, hi everyone. Are you here for the parametric engineering course? Yeah, good. Not many of us today, so it feels quite intimate. Uh, my name is Vladimir, I'm from Define Engineers. Um, so this week we're looking at parametric engineering, sort of the topic of the, of the course. So we'll be looking at combining structural analysis um, natively inside Grasshopper. So over the weeks so far, you've looked at Rhino as sort of a base package for geometry and drafting and 3D modeling. Then you got the grips with the, basic of the basics of Grasshopper and sort of the basic functionality of uh, points and lines and, and parametric manipulation. Um, a couple of weeks ago with Toby, you had a look at um, form finding in a very sort of basic way with uh, spring particle models, um, kangaroo. Um, kangaroo can also do geometric optimization, so rationalize geometry, not just do form finding. It sort of is the same thing, but it's, it's also not. And this week, we're looking at Caramba, which is a, a finite element solver, which is inside Grasshopper. Um, that makes it quite nice. It makes it very easy to work with. At the same time, it's a very, it's a pretty basic fine element package. So don't expect too much from it. It's meant to be used for early days analysis, conceptual studies, and things like this. Um, probably ideal for a university project or some kind of a research. Um, applied research, let's say. So with Caramba, we can do normal structural analysis, which is okay, we take a bit of geometry and we analyze it. And we can also use it because it's in a parametric environment, we can also use it to optimize structures. Okay, so the process that we want to show you is essentially going through this whole loop of starting off from setting up your boundary conditions, form finding, geometric optimization, analysis, and structure optimization. And then once everything's connected, you should have full control of your design, both geometrically and mechanically. So there are a lot of packages out there to do various things. So Rhino, as, as we said, Rhino is the base package. Grasshopper is a parametric bit. Um, I'm sure Paul has told you a lot about uh, his, uh, his baby um, Salamander. There's a new version of Salamander. Essentially, Salamander is a translator from Grasshopper and Rhino into uh, Design Link, which is uh, basically translating data from Rhino and Grasshopper into other software. So more serious analysis software like Oasis GSA um, and so on. So as an example today, we're gonna to do something real simple. We're gonna look at a truss, the very basic engineering problem. And I've chosen the Pratt truss as an example. Uh, the Pratt is good because the diagonals are only taking tension, so it's very good for, for um, it's very lightweight truss. Uh, there are obviously all these other trusses out there. So we're going to build a parametric truss, very simple. Um, and the problem is kind of a classic problem. We need to span from A to B to carry a load X and do it with the least possible material. Sounds pretty basic. Um, we should be able to do this in the 21st century with, automatically. So as I said, we're going to be using this software called Caramba. It's a bit of software written by Clemens in uh, TU Vienna. Uh, that was his um, doctoral uh, research. He wrote uh, Caramba. So what does he do? It's pretty much what you would expect from any fine element package, a basic uh, fine element package. It has first order and second order um, linear analysis. Then it also does large deformation analysis, okay, so nonlinear geometry. 
it can do eigenvalue analysis for buckling and eigenvalue analysis for natural frequency. And it has some optimizers uh, written in, which I'll show you. I'll show you how they work. Unfortunately, your machines don't have, we've got a bit of a glitch, your machines don't have the optimizer component, uh, which is a bit annoying. But I have it on this machine, so I'll just, and it's just the last bit. So I'll just show you this on this machine, and you'll be able to see this recording. And uh, hopefully we get that um, missing component rolled out on all the other machines. So that's all the slides. If we just jump into Rhino and uh, open Grasshopper. Right, okay, so now we up and running. And we're gonna start with just building the truss. Um, in terms of Grasshopper complexity, what we're gonna do today is very, very simple. We're just gonna build a simple Pratt truss, a bunch of lines connected at nodes. Um, connected at nodes is very important if you've ever done any final element analysis. So connectivity is key. So let's start with just having a simple point um, a panel and we input the, the origin of the model. Zero, zero. And we want to create a point object at that coordinate. So we want to create a second point now, um, which is at a distance of the span. So we need a slider between, um, say, 1 and 35 meters. And we want to go, our truss will be in the XZ plane. So we, now we need a point along the X axis. So we will be creating a um, unit vector in X. Multiplied by the span. So we can call this slider span. And using the addition parameter, we're going to take this point And we're going to add this point vector with the new x vector to give us the new point and create a line between them. So, line between two points. That's in uh, curve primitive and line. Now we should have our line and let's say we give it around 30 meters for now just so we can see what's happening. Now this is this is gonna be the bottom court. Um, we're gonna have to Divide this up into the number of base of the truss. So we're using for this we're using the component divide curve. You can also find this in the curve division. Tap. So we're going to take this curve, and we need as an input parameter we need the number of segments. So let's have another uh, integer slider here, which is from, um, shall we say, 1 to 100. We can call this slider base, so number of base. And input this into the count input. A 
this around uh, around 15, 12, 15. So now we need to create the top court. So let's have a parameter which is the height of the truss, uh, a slider. So say that would be a real number slider between um, 0 0.1 and 8. You can obviously choose your own um, inputs. Um, so we need to offset this curve up. And we need we use the we use the move parameter to do this. The move component, which is this taking the geometry in. So we take the original bottom chord line and we need to translate that in the Z direction. So again, a unit Z vector. Having a, a scalar of our height slider. So that, that will give us the top court. Again, we need to split that up in the number of base, same as the bottom court. So we copy this component across and we use this output line from the top court to divide it up into the same number of base. So what we need to do now is to build the diagonals and the verticals of the truss. And to do this, we're going to have to use the um, shift list component. In order to filter the points and shift the list by one point, um, so we can create the diagonals of the truss between those shifted two shifted lists of points. So the division points of the bottom chords would have to go into the list input of this shift list component, which is in sets lists shift list. So by default, the shift offset is 1, so we're going to keep this default value at 1, which means that this list, um, once we have, so it's the important thing here is to, to turn the uh, warp off, so we can just have a, a toggle button here and turn it to false. So now you can see I've got these components selected. You can see that Grasshopper is just selecting. Um, it's starting counting from the second point onwards. So I've shifted this list of points by one. And because the warp is off, that means that it doesn't add the last point onto the list at the end. It just keeps, and the last point is the original last point in the, um, in the first series. So we need to do the same thing now for the top court. We just copy this across, get this over. So here we use uh, another component, which is the shortest list. Again, two of those. One for the top, one for the bottom. So 
we want to create the diagonals between the shift this shifted list of the top court points, division points, which are um, those and the original bottom court points and vice versa. So for this component we take the the out the, the point outputs from here which will give us from some reason this component is not doing what it should be doing. Sorry, that, that's fine. So <clears throat> we take the shifted list from the bottom court, um, which is this upper few components, that one. And we take the full um, set of points from the top court, and we run them through this shortest list component. And what that does, it basically takes those 12 points, which are from the shifted uh, list of the bottom chords, and those 13 points from the top chord, and it connects them to the shortest uh, list length. So if we now create a, a line between each two sets of points, we should be getting our diagonals here. So because it's a Pratt truss, half of the diagonals to the mid-span are pointing in one direction and the other half are pointing in the other direction. So for a truss which is in bending, always in sagging bending, um, the diagonals will be in tension. So what we need to do now is we need to filter half of these diagonals on one side and half of them in, in, on the other side. So in order to do this, um, we just take the number of base and we divide it by two. Simple as that. So division by two. So we can just directly uh, right click on the B parameter here and just uh, input two. And we divide the number of base by that. So to filter out half of them, we're going to use a component split list. And take the two sets of diagonals.
and we split them at this index 6 in my case. So if we just have a, a simple line line geometry parameter here we have two lists after the splitting so from 0 to 5 and and the rest so we can do this for the top and the bottom So for the top set, we have list A, which is the, the first five items, and then from the bottom set, we have the second half, which is the B list. So these are the left diagonals. We can group those and just give them a name. left diagonals and those at the right so for the bottom court we need to do something similar so we use a shortest list again, and this time we select um, the shortest list between the shifted bottom court points, which is this one. And the original bottom court points, which is this one. create lines again between them so you won't be able to see all the lines separately here but at the moment the way I have this routine running is I'm only viewing the parameters that I'm selecting so the idea here is that we have all these lines um, for the bottom court which are individual lines rather than a straight line just one So we need to do exactly the same for the top court. So there should be 12. In my case, I have 12 base. So I need to see 12 lines for the top. Uh, bottom chords and then the diagonals so the only thing missing now are the verticals and that's simply done by drawing lines between two, po two sets of points and those two sets of points are simply the top chord divisions and the bottom chord divisions.
So just for completeness, I'm going to create three line geometry components. So we're going to group this and call it bottom court. This one is verticals. And the top court. So that gives us the geometry of the truss. which has a variable span, number of base, and a variable height. So that completes the geometry exercise. So we can just group all these a uh, bit of the routine and call it um, trust geometry so there's not really much new um, material in this part it's very simple um, geometry manipulation and the output from this is what we're going to use to build the final element model so going into Caramba <clears throat> so Caramba has these tabs which are grouped nicely um, depending on the functions so it has pretty much everything you can expect from a basic fine element piece of software in the algorithms tab we have the different solvers as I said there is the um, um, linear um, and the nonlinear solvers, then eigenvalue analysis and the optimizers. In the cross section, you can select line cross sections or shell cross sections. It also has uh, some more fun funky features like um, eccentricities on beams and so on. So for the optimizer function, Caramba offers um, uh, sort of a, a list of cross sections from which the optimizer can run through and just select uh, the appropriate ones. Then there is an exporter, which I've never really used. A loading, so over the years Caramba has evolved to be quite neat and quite simple to use, um, yet it's still quite powerful uh, if used for the right problems. It's, it, the solver runs really well for beams, so if you have a kind of a stick models, it's actually quite good. Um, and we verified it um, a lot and I think <clears throat> there's been some research with Dr. Phillips and the results have been verified for the stick elements. Now for, for shells, Caramba uses um, <clears throat> it uses the um, constant tra strain triangle elements, which means that they're quite bad in terms of um, <coughs> accuracy. So you need a lot of elements to get decent accuracy out of a uh, constant strain triangles. So my recommendation is you, if you model something which else, just do uh, a proper um, sort of quality control of your model. Make sure you have enough mesh and you get a proper convergence on the on the results. So we're going to be building a stick model today. So we'll keep it really simple. Um, so let's start by creating some line elements. So there is a component in Caramba called line to beam that takes uh, lines 
a collection of lines and turns, it, turns them into beam elements. And you can find this in the model tab under line to beam. So we have, of course, we can model this truss with just one single cross section, in which case we just plug all of these um, line sets into the line input of this component. It would, it would just give us um, a bunch of a bunch of line elements which will all have the same name and the same cross section. Um, what we actually want to do is we want to have different elements for the different components of the truss. So let's have um, upper and lower chords and diagonals and vertical separately. So using the panel, we can give these um, um, elements identifiers. So the beam ID, let's say the top one is upper chord. plug that into the beam ID input that command will be the <coughs> bottom court Um, diagonals <coughs> and the verticals. Right, so we grab bottom court and we put it into the line input and so on, verticals, top court. And for the diagonals, we have two inputs from two sets. So there is a... <clears throat> quite a bizarre thing here in Caramba, which is the parameters, parameters, it's a bit strange. So each subset of the functionality, let's say, of this, of, of, of this uh, routine has to be assembled, if you like. So we assemble the elements using these um, element parameters, and you can find those in Caramba params elements. And those assemblies essentially take, they can take any element type. So that could be a beam truss, etc. So we just, all we need to do is just plug all of these in here. In some ways, it makes the model tidier because then at the end you have elements, materials. Um, loads, supports, etc. You're going to have all of these parameters inside uh, the routine and then their outputs get plugged into the analysis or the, the solver component. So this is all we need to do to set up the elements. So we can move on to the support conditions. So for the support we need this component here in model support down at the bottom so what we want to do is we want to support, if I just select all the bits of the <coughs> truss, just make it a little bit simpler. 
in a truss like this, in order to have a stable fan element model, we want to support the bottom two corners as a simply supported beam. So we have a pin and a roller, and we also want to support the truss from rolling. So we support the top um, end points in out of plane, so in direction Y. And then we're going to have a stable model and uh, no warnings or errors. So to do that, we need to get those points. Um, so that means I need three different types of support conditions. So I need a pin, which will be translational support in X, Y, Z. Then I need another one of those components, which is just going to be Y and Z. That's the roller. And one more, which is just in direction Y, which is the out-of-plane restraint. So for the first, we need to import. Uh, we need to input a uh, coordinate. So we simply take this origin point here right from the start of our routine so there is a plane input parameter which by default remains as the global coordinate system we're happy with this for the roller we need the end of the bottom court and we can grab this from Obviously, the second point we created, this one here. And for the top court endpoints, we can extract the items or the start and the end points of the list by using the list item component. And if you zoom in far enough and click on that top plus, we get a minus, so I minus one and I, so I will be the first um, parameter from the output, from the list, and I minus one would be the last one. So this list is the list of points in the top court. So this list item component should extract with minus one and I should extract two endpoints of the top court and we can use both of them into this um, support okay so now we have our supports we can assemble all this using the support component in Karamba. Again, that's in the params support. So we have um, elements, supports, we should assign some loads. So we'll need to create a slider uh, which will be our linear, linear load. So we can have another slider here, oh, not this one. So let's say this will be between 0 and 100, well, let's say 0 0.1 to 100. And 
we can name this slider load kilonewtons per meter. So one important thing about Karamba is that you have to run you have to run your models in uh, meters, so the units has to be in meters. And it's using it's the the units are somewhat locked in, so it's using European European uh, engineering units, so it's centimeters, kilonewtons. Um, so it could be a little bit it it could take some time to to get used to it. Um, of course, you can manipulate the units, but then it gets quite confusing because it does it does expect um, those units. So stress is in kilonewton centimeters squared and strange things that I don't quite understand. So for the loads, we just use the loads component, which is the component that uh, you can use to set up any sort of loads in the model. And in here, there's a drop down menu which gives us a choice of all sorts of different load types. So, Caramba can do um, obviously a global gravity acceleration, um, point loads, imperfections, initial strains, temperature, etc. etc. So we're going to use uh, the point loads. If you just hover over these input parameters, Caramba is telling you what he's expecting. So a force vector in kilonewtons, a moment in kilonewton meters, and so on. So the unit is something that uh, needs a bit of uh, getting used to. So having set up our linear load here, in order to apply point load, so if we just, again, visualize our truss, I want to apply point loads at every note of the top court and in order to do this I need to calculate the maximum load along the truss and divide it by the number of base <coughs> so I can simply multiply that linear load by the length of the truss or the span Divided by <clears throat> divided by the number of points in the top court. So I can get the number of points by getting the length of a list. So list length component. So that's in list sets. Sorry, in sets list tab and list length. I just divide one by the other. <clears throat> to give me the kilonewton value per point. So, Caramba is generally working, unless it's particularly, unless it's specified by the user, Caramba will be working to the global coordinate system. Which means that having a positive load um, will be generally in the upwards direction. So I want my load to be vertical, vertically applied downwards. So I need the negative of this value, first of all. And then I need it to be in the z direction. So a unit z vector. 
So now my load is um, 0, 0, minus 101 in my case, which is my loading vector per point. And I can plug into the force input. So you can see here we have force moment loco. So if loco is set to true, um, the load rotates with the node in large deformation analysis. So in linear static, it doesn't really matter. In the position index, we need to, to um, input all the coordinates of the points which we're going to be loading. So those are simply just the, the division points of the top court. Again, this component here is quite popular. And then we have this load case. So if you have multiple load cases like gravity, um, live load, superimposed bed load, whatever you might have, you can name those in here. In our case, we just have a panel with um, one, let's say. So this is load case one. We're not gonna run anymore. So this is just to show you the basic functionality of, of Caramba. What we're also gonna have is a gravity load case. So in load, loads again, gravity. So if we want to run the gravity together with this um, linear load in one load case, we can just have them name the same thing. And now Caramba will run them together. So you won't be able, in the results, in the post-processing bit, you won't be able to differentiate um, what is the effect of one or the other load. Uh, if, if you disconnect this bit and then use the default for that one, which is zero, in the post-processing, you're going to have a drop-down menu. So you can say, OK, that's my effect from gravity. That's my effect from the linear load. So let's just run them together for now. So again, we need to assemble those in the params. We have load. We assemble the, lo assemble the loads together. So we've got two more things to do before we've got a, a working model. So we have to set up the cross sections or the geometry of our elements and also choose the material. So the cross sections we can grab from cross section tab. You can see in this very basic cross-section parameter um, component, sorry, we have a choice of different shapes of cross-sections, and you can manually input pretty much everything that defines them: the wall thicknesses, the upper, the lower chords, and, and so on. Um, you can give them names and families, and so on. So, if you want to get um, into sort of uh, building these more complex things you can go into the uh, Caramba manual <clears throat> and learn how to how to do this I think at the moment we're just gonna so there are two things as I said at the beginning there is a cross-section optimizer um, which runs on a list of cross-sections so it just rolls through all the different cross-sections in the list and selects the one with the highest utilization you can just simply because you don't have it in your machines. I think what we're going to do is we're just going to run it with one cross section, see it running, and then I'll modify this thing here on this machine and show you how it runs with the optimizer. So 
So for now, what we can do, let's just grab this cross-section component, which has some predefined values. You can see here, you can even use a panel to see what cross-section you're selecting. Okay, so we have a 10 centimeters height. Again, as I said, it's in centimeters, bizarrely. So, flange width, so it's a 10 by five box. Uh, so if you choose the box, that's the default that comes out. So let's just stick with the default for now. Um, obviously for, I think at the moment we have a truss which is 27 meters long. So 100 by five, 100 by 50 is probably not going to do it, but just just um, for the sake of um, showing you how it works. So and again, we need to assemble the cross sections. So we use this cross sections parameter components. And in the element IDs, we need to connect which elements have which cross-section. So we defined our elements up here. So we have up chord, bottom chord, diagonals and verticals. What we can simply do if we want all the elements to have the same cross-section in this panel, we can say, just list them all. So now simply we've just assigned the same cross-section to all the elements, which is a bit counterintuitive to having, dif to having different elements to define the different parts of the truss. So again, just for illustration purposes, the last thing we need to set up are the materials. So we can just use this material selection component that allows us to choose a family of materials. So we're gonna go for steel, S355. And we can just drag this component, this panel, so we can use the same element IDs. Again, assemble that. So now we have these five sets of data and we can plug those in into the solver component. So we're going to use linear static, which is this one in algorithms, the top one, first order analysis. And in the model input, Before we do this, we need to actually assemble this model. So there is another step before that, which is in Caramba model, assemble model. We need to get all these data in. So we have elements, supports, loads sections so because those lists are all we need to just flatten those lists basically if you're getting an error, all these need to be flat lists that go into the assembly component. So this, this 
assemble model component is basically the last final bit before is the last bit of the pre-processing part and then that gets run through the solver which is this one and you can run through run this assembled model through all of these different types of analysis so that's the equivalent of just going into abacus and selecting linear or nonlinear and so on so this component the assembly component gives you a bit of information about the model so it gives you the overall mass so in this case we have a 1100 kilograms and the center location of the center of gravity of the model once it's run it also gives us displacements and the resulting force of gravity so okay so that's 11 kilonewtons makes sense so this is now the analysis done and we can do a bit of post-processing we can add a panel here to to the mass just so we can check the weight of our structure So to do some post-processing, there is a component called model view in results, in the results tab, the second one is model view. So if we grab that and get the, the solved model, so these solver components have a model input and a model output. So the model input is unsolved and the model output is the solved model. We plug that in into this post-processing component. And on my screen, well, you can see that I can, I'm getting a deformed, a deformed shape for my truss. Obviously a bit out of proportion. So you can correct this with this display scales. That gives you um, a bunch of options on what you can see. So you can turn the loads on and off. You can turn, and the loads are just the load arrows, so you can see uh, where, you've, where you've got loads applied. And the supports as well, so you have little arrows uh, pointing the orientations of your supports. The local axis of the elements, and we don't have joints in this model, so you can turn the deflected shape on and off using this tab here. And you can use the, you can uh, change the scale accordingly. So you have two more types: render settings. So this is the resolution of the render. Um, so we don't have a, we don't have a. Um, a contour plot showing at the moment so we this is not really doing anything for us but then you can also have uh, tags so node tags element tags so if you're doing some connectivity if you have a connectivity problem where you need to know which bit is connecting to to which bit, and if you have all the nodes uh, in the right place you can uh, study the model using these tabs you have the element IDs so zooming in you can tell whether you have the right properties applied to the right elements so I think this model is fine <coughs> you can just check it also by cross-section names so we have uh, types of cross-section by materials and so on and down here we also have a load case selector so we can select the different load cases obviously load case 0 doesn't really exist because well there is there are no loads in it uh, we just went straight into load case 1 so if we just come back here and 
disconnect this, we'll get zero will be gravity and one will be the point load, so we can just change this to zero. And now we'll just have one. And this is the point loads together with the gravity. <clears throat> right, so there's another post processing um, component called Beam View. So beam view again in results, you can keep daisy chaining those components here um, in, in, in the post-processing part. So beam view gives us um, a contour plot on the elements. Um, for displacement, utilization, and axial stress. And it also can give us diagrams, so bending moment diagrams, shear force diagrams, and so on. change the scale to make it more or less visible add or remove the numbers and you can use a combination of the two components to display your results in the most uh, useful and visible way so whether you display your results on a, on a deformed shape or you just have it undeformed in, in a 2D structure like this, you might want to view it just uh, in a parallel projection like this and, and have some numbers on. Obviously, that's not very readable. You can also draw a legend on, let's say we select the utilization. We don't want a diagram, we just want to find out how stressed these um, elements are. So we use a legend for this. So a legend is a, is a generic grasshopper component. It needs color inputs and the tags. So this is the legend um, color coded from the least um, stressed to the to the most stressed elements, going from negative to positive. So positive in most FE softwares, positive is tension, negative is in compression. That all makes sense in our structure because the top chord is red and the bottom is uh, blue for tension. But we can see that our elements are overstressed by 400% in my case, so we need to up the cross section. And if you right click on this R input parameter for uh, of, the, of the legend, you can draw this rectangle on the screen make it bigger and now we can just say print this Let's say we can print this or PDF it and uh, put it in a, in a calculation report if we want to. So that's one way to post-process results from, from Caramba. We also have the displacement contour. So we've got 32 centimeters, so quite a bit of deflection.
So one, so this is a way to get the visual results of the model. Another thing you can do is um, getting the numerical results, which is probably a little bit more useful for engineering. And that's if you take the um, beam forces component. Again, that comes out of the model. So in here you can select individual beam IDs to filter. So with the panel you can filter, let's say, verticals. And now we know that we're only going to get the forces for the verticals. So this is the first, second, third, etc. vertical in the truss. And these are the um, reported um, axial forces. So N is the axial force in kilonewtons. As I said, negative compression positive is tension and uh, the reported values are at the end of the of the element at the start and at the end so we have 10 verticals in this case and so on so shear forces uh, the two moments and and the twist so with this component you can again you can uh, filter on load cases you can filter on the maximum distance between results so if you have a very long element you can work with that and you can get sort of a higher resolution using more uh, getting more um, more values per beam so you can just get into this in more detail and, and play around with it um, based on this model or you can build your own models um, the form finding exercise that Toby did a few weeks ago is quite a nice one to try to um, connect together with Caramba. So in, in a combined model, you're going to get a form found structure, which is also being analyzed simultaneously. So Caramba will be running together with Kangaroo, um, which is quite handy. It's really where the, uh, where the power of this parametric engineering comes to itself, because um, having a single model, you know, building an FE analysis for it, checking the results, designing for it, is something that the engineering industry has been doing for, for ages. But having this recursive, having this loop through all these things is quite powerful. So one la last bit I want to show you, and that's the bit that, uh, that unfortunately you can run on your machines, is the, um, the optimizer. So in order for this to run, I need to change the cross-section from a simple cross-section uh, parameter like this to a cross-section selector, which will filter through a lot of, uh, of cross-sections at the same time. So this is a cross-section selector. I'm going to use the same sets here so all my elements would get optimized. I also need this component which is the range selector uh, which gives me a choice of okay I have a country range a shape uh, let's run it with uh, CHS 
for the UK. And let's go for HSH. So that's a list of cross sections. So if I just show you what this looks like, that's just a long list of all the different CHS is available in that list. So if I just change, okay, I can go for I-beams and that gives me the full list of I-beams. <clears throat> That's all I need here. Actually, I'm just going to keep this on. And we plug this here instead of the instead of just a single cross section. So now the model is going to be running through all of these. So the other bit I need to do <clears throat> I need to run the, the design optimizer which is this one here and what it does, okay, there's a little explanation for each set of forces it selects the optimum cross-section and that's according to Eurocode 3 so okay, so it clearly that's done for, that's just for steel So that takes as an input the already solved linear static model. Again, the same thing I need. Um, I said that I would like to optimize all the elements. So I get those IDs. And in here, I have the same set of cross sections that I have here. So now, what this does, it just runs through all of these cross sections here and finds the one that's closest to a utilization of one. So you can specify the maximum utilization a cross section can go to. So it can go to 100% utilization, so it's fully fully used. Uh, any more loads is going to be overstressed, or you would have a stability problem, etc. Obviously, if you do that, uh, that doesn't take into account the fact that the structure might be driven by serviceability. So you might have to limit the deflection of the of the truss in this case, so you don't get a, a really lightweight truss which deflects 10 meters, for example. So um, you can do this by setting a deflection limit relative to the span, uh, which is what we usually do. So let's say we have, um, I want a, a limit of L over 360, let's say, for the sake of argument. So i give it a panel here with 360. I divide my span by, by that. So my allowable deflection would be 75 millimeters. So that's in max displacement.
really doing it for some <coughs> reason. Two cross sections are too big. Okay, so it seems to have run it now, and I'm getting quite a big displacement. So I'm just going to make the span smaller. So this seems to be running now. So Okay, so now we're viewing the results from the optimization. So to answer the original question at the beginning, how do we get the lightest structure to span between two points with a given load, uh, we need to do some sort of an optimization. So what this cross-section optimizer does, it just selects from a list of available cross sections, which is this, it selects the one, the cross sections that are closest to 100% utilization for a given displacement. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell, that doesn't necessarily give us the lightest structure because we can have more diagonals or less diagonals. So the, the number of divisions of the truss could vary, and that could give us a more efficient structure. In addition. Um, we should also be able to vary the height of the truss. Um, obviously, the higher the truss is, the more efficiently it works um, as a general principle. So, in order to go through all these options, we need to run... Uh, uh, in, let's just run Galapagos in this case. You've already explored that um, last week. So. using Galapagos we want to vary the base and the depth or the height of the truss and the fitness function or the fitness um, input uh, would be the tonnage so we want to minimize the tonnage so, okay, that's uh, 
change the mass of the model. So at the moment we have 340 kilograms. We want to optimize this having this single objective. And if we open the Galapagos editor, we can just go to minimize and run this over. I don't know <clears throat> about uh, Gal Galapagos itself is obviously um, it's based around genetic algorithms so as such is somewhat uh, um, a black box approach so in theory in the limit and for some problems it would, ta would take longer than for others in theory after having the right solution domain in the limit, we should be getting towards an optimal answer. So we started off with 340, I think, for our, for, for our uh, boundary conditions here. And we already have a couple of solutions which are lower than this. So after, <clears throat> after some time, and there, depending on how well we understand our problem when we set it up, in Galapagos, we could um, have various success in getting results out and and being able to actually accurately interpret the results. Obviously, this problem is very simple. It just looks at uh, the, the more permutation it looks at, the more likely it will reach an answer. So that's a fairly simple problem. Obviously, when there are multiple parameters. Um, confronting each other that could be more challenging for for this type of optimization so anyway this is just to demonstrate um, how we can link up caramba uh, grasshopper and caramba together with Galapagos so you can download um, we will make this file available and you can download the full routine uh, which has the optimization bit with the Galapagos and you can play around with it yourselves because um, yeah it's not running on these machines so yeah that's the intro to Caramba for today <laughs>